So I'm going to start now. Um, on behalf of the Melbourne Theosophical Society, um, I extend a very warm welcome to you all. And I have to continue admitting people as we, um, as I'm doing this intro. Um, my name's Gunnel. I'm the event coordinator for the Melbourne Theosophical Society. Uh, and to initiate proceedings, it's customary that we present the objects of the society. These are to form a nucleus of the universal brotherhood of humanity without distinction of race, creed, sex, caste, or color. To encourage a study of comparative religion, philosophy, and science, and to investigate the unexplained laws of nature and the powers latent in the human being. It's a privilege to host this talk um, and that will be presented over four Saturdays starting today. And of course, as previously stated, these are standalone and will be recorded as well as the, the pre-event um, that was recorded last year, which I all recommend. If you haven't done, please, please do so. That will also be put on the Meetup site. Um, the speaker today is Dr. Donna Golding, and Donna is fascinated by the miracle of life and how humans and the cosmos works. And just a little bit about Donna. Dr. Donna Golding studied psychology, first in Vancouver, Canada, and later in Melbourne, gaining a PhD and specializing in transpersonal psychology, which covers the states of consciousness, spirituality, and the phenomenon of spiritual experience and development. As a psychologist in Melbourne, she provided counseling, teaching, supervision, and developed and presented a variety of corporate and general public seminars and workshops. She's been a lecturer in psychology and counseling at Beyond Blue Workplace Trainer, and Donna is a published author of two books about transpersonal spiritual development that are all printed in English as well as German. In March 2019, Donna returned to her hometown of Vancouver to be closer to her family. She registered her, she registered her Canadian business to work as a registered clinical counsellor, but later decided to resign and offer uh, voluntary work. So um, thank you again for joining us, uh, Donna, and I hand it to you. And also just, can everybody mute? Um, we have 20 minutes at the end for questions and chat. Which you, where you can obviously unmute, but during also you can, I'll open the chat line so you can also, you know, um, ask questions. But I, the last half an hour has been um, dedicated to questions and chat. So over to you, Donna, and welcome. Thank you very much. So, okay, so this is, we are all from spirit and it's complex concepts on consciousness and manifestation simplified. So I'm going to use this um, PowerPoint because it's going to help uh, keep me in line and it um, is helpful for you, the audience, especially because this is by Zoom rather than just to see me. So the first seminar is the theosophy of how life manifests. The second one continues on from that higher consciousness and human being. The third one continues on from that. And this is about understanding and interpreting spiritual, metaphysical, higher consciousness experiences versus a psychotic. Okay? And the last one is effects and transformations from having these different kinds of experiences and the power of love. Now, these overlap and intertwine. And the fourth one kind of takes us uh, right full circle back to the first one. Okay, so let's start. So this is the theosophy of how life manifests. It's in three parts, two main parts. Part one is largely about the book called I Am That. And that, the I Am That book is Concepts of Manifestation. And part two is theosophical quotes on enlightenment. And the final um, finale is just a conclusive note, just two little pages. Okay, so part one. Uh, and this is the book over here, the I Am That book, is um, book Concepts on Manifestation. And in a nutshell here, I could end the seminar now, we manifest from pure consciousness from supreme source for life experience. That's the message in a nutshell. So I Am That book is a collection of talks on non-dualism. I'm just going to move these um, pictures over. Oops. I'm just going to move this picture out of here to get out of my way. Okay. 
No, okay, I'm gonna have to move it even further. I'm gonna minimize it. There we go. Okay, so the I Am That book is a collection of talks on non-dualism philosophy by this fellow here, Nisargadatta Data Maharaj, a Hindu spiritual teacher who lived in Mumbai and died in 1981. And so this first section has a lot of his quotes as well. And I love this very first one. He's, he says, in the stillness of the mind, still, still, still mind, in the stillness of the mind, I saw myself as I am, unbound. So that says a lot in itself right there as well. So now I'm going to take you through the steps of how we manifest from supreme source, according to theosophy. We start with this uh, number one, supreme source and pure consciousness. Now, I made it in this blob here with a mottled background to um, depict what pure consciousness is, the supreme source, the essence of life. It's just this mottled. And then number two, from the supreme source, we have the I am, the being, the pure witness bubbles up within supreme source. And then the I am pure witness can see its reflection, the reflected witness, and this is in reflected consciousness, reflected from here. And then finally, number five, we come down to uh, the ego sense of self. So that's more the physical, human, mental sense of self, the ego. So let's take it one by one. And the first one is the supreme source. Now, these words and phrases describe and depict supreme source. Um, so you can interchange any of these words here, more or less, to say uh, supreme source. It is uh, the same as pure consciousness, as universal consciousness, as love and bliss, as mind. And this has a capital M, mind, the all and wisdom, it's pure awareness and pure being. The supreme source is also the unmanifest and therefore consequently, subsequently, potential source of life, light and matter. It is beyond existence and non-existence. Some call it the void, uncaused and unvarying. Uh, it is non-dual. And it is reality with this capital R here, primordial reality. There is no cognition in the supreme source. So that means no thinking, no thoughts, no analyzing, no perception. It's just knowing. It's just pure wisdom without the thinking. There is no time and no space uh, related to this. And it knows no beginning or end. Okay. This will become clear as we go um, down through these, uh, scroll down through these um, PowerPoints. So the Supreme Source conceives or reflects itself. So here we have the model Supreme Source and this reflection down here. I tried to, to do this shadow effect down here. So the Supreme Source, reality, pure consciousness, universal consciousness, mind. And another way to say that is an underlying essence of all in the universe, it actually manifests as a reflection of itself. And it is like light from a movie projects onto a movie screen. Okay, so reality, this reality is reflected onto uh, secondary consciousness, reflected consciousness. And this is the platform that contains and holds the physical world right here. So it, ref it reflects and conceives itself. And the universe is all of, I'm gonna to try to move that out of the way too, put that down. Okay, so the universe is all of space and time and their contents, including the planets, the stars, the galaxies, and all other forms of matter and energy, and you and me. So we are in the universe now, in consciousness, reflected consciousness. So this supreme source, the mottled background, and then we've got this bubble up here, all these little bubbles, this is the I am. And this is a quote here, and I just added in you are. I am, you are, Maurice, Sheila, 
all of you people, you are a point of awareness. And, th and this is a part of this pure being, a speck of pure consciousness of mind. So all of these little bubbles here um, that have bubbled up from Supreme Source, I'm using as depicting the I am, uh, the pure being. So before all beginnings, Maharaj says, and I'm depicting this as birth beginnings, and after all endings, which is death, I'm saying, there is the I am. And Maharish says, all has its beginning, its essence in me, in the I am that shines in every living being. Okay. Now, my comment is this is more a passive being rather than an active being or doing. And this is why it's kind of got this capital B there as well. It's more primordial. So being and I am is universal. It relates to every I am in the same way. And he says it's not an experience per se. It's hard to get words for things that are ineffable, that don't really have words to describe them. So it's not really an experience. It does not depend on memories, on expectations, desires, fears, likes, and dislikes. Rather, it is steady. It is changeless. There is a beginninglessness and endless. It's ever new and ever fresh. So we've got the supreme source and the I am within the supreme source. So self with a capital S is this pure witness that bubbles up. So you are self, a point of awareness, a pure witness that is within and also emerges from this pure consciousness. That's why I put it within this other blob. Self, as a part of Supreme Source, looks at, so to speak, not with eyes, it just looks at, it knows the wisdom and creative potential of the, pre of the Supreme Source and of itself. So it knows it. But this is actually, this pure witness, it's a detached witnessing. So you are a motionless witness on the river of consciousness. So this is the river of life, the river of reflected consciousness. You're a, As a pure witness, you are detached, um, just looking at the river of consciousness, which changes eternally without changing you in any way. So here we have all of these little specks of mind, the source, the wisdom. So pure witness can um, project onto the screen of consciousness. So that's the projection onto the screen of consciousness. This is the reflected consciousness. And it can see life here. It can see a reflected witness. And we now have duality manifested life. This is not manifested, reflects on, projects onto the World Wide Web, uh, so to speak, uh, into reflected consciousness. So it's a little bit like a... Pure witness is a bit like a spider person. So I found this cute little spider here. And it's, it's a spider person. And like a spider projects its web, the pure witness projects what is within itself to the outside. So the pure witness is here within pure source, projects out, sees what is in reflected conscious, sees all of that, and sees itself here, which I will tell you about in a minute. Now, this quote is from uh, uh, a, a different Maharisha. And this is, just as the spider, this first picture here, emits the thread of the web. So this is the, the thread of the web from him. So just as the spider emits the thread of the web outside of itself, and again, withdraws it back into itself, likewise, the mind here from the pure witness projects the world um, out of the self and the world appears. So this was a quote from, now I, the, there's writing the way I can't see, one of the Maharishas. Now I want to get, <clears throat> give you two analogies um, regarding specks of consciousness. So this first one here is this uh, sifter of flour is pure consciousness. 
And we are these specks of pure consciousness that is sifted out uh, from it emerging into this pile of life experience. So this mound of sifted flour is the collective individual specks of consciousness um, living together, kind of baking life if it were flour. However, uh, we do not separate totally from source as there is a transparent spiritual link. We are all extensions. So we don't actually separate. There is, we are extensions of source. Okay. Now the second analogy is with fire. So the fire is pure consciousness and we are specks of pure consciousness and sparks from it emerging into this space of life existence. So the dark uh, background is the movie screen of life holding individual specks of consciousness living together in our galaxy. Uh, again, just to remind you, we do not separate totally from source as there is a transparent spiritual link. We are all extensions of source. Okay, another quote. Uh, so here we are, light I am, peace I am, bliss I am. I am neither inside nor outside. I am what is beyond the outside and the inside. A little bit paradoxical. Your consciousness I am, ever free, peaceful, and blissful. And on the right-hand side over here, all these things that I lifted from internet and put together. So pure consciousness is that which makes all the thoughts and sensations we experience possible. That's where it originates from, from pure um, consciousness. And consciousness is um, like the movie screen. This is the Netflix screen here. Consciousness is like the movie screen upon which the movies are projected. So from pure consciousness projected onto the secondary reflected consciousness, and that is life. And so this is the little I am that is projecting out onto the Netflix screen of life in reflected consciousness. So we go from unity to duality, the shadow effect. Again, I've tried to depict the shadow effect here. So reflected consciousness, this green blob, is, is like, not exactly the same, but it's like the shadow of pure consciousness or a mirror effect reflection. So we go from unity to duality, from the unmanifest to the manifest. And this reflection is consciousness. It's a, what I call a secondary form of pure consciousness. And this little quote here, the pure consciousness is the one wound from which the entire universe has risen. So we go from unitary consciousness that is formless to secondary consciousness. That's my word, my term, secondary consciousness, that is a platform, formless to a platform that holds or contains that which is an expression of pure consciousness including its many witnesses. So let's talk about the pure witness down to the reflected witness. So when the pure witness, and I've got, this is the pure witness on this side. When the pure witness looks at the reflection in consciousness, so we're gonna have to use our imagination. This is the reflection here. And when it also identifies with it and it says, look, okay, that is me it identifies that as that person, then a newer, broader identity is formed. And as reflected witness, only as reflected witness, it sees itself and other reflection and takes on life in reflected consciousness. So as reflected witness, it senses that this is me, um, this is mine on the screen of reflection. So it senses that this is me, that's my hat, that's my jacket, and it can look in mirrors and mirrors, and it sees that this is me and mine. So we now have duality. So the I am pure witness over here can be in both pure consciousness and its reflection, secondary consciousness. It can become 
coextensive with time and space as a reflected witness. So a little formula here that I put down is from matter, the universe and its contents materialized is from advanced projected thought from pure source. So pure consciousness, the all, wisdom, knowledge, goes to identification, subtle thought forms, and manifestation. It's a little bit of a line there. Now, a couple of points from the secret doctrine. Again, we've got this model background depicting pure source. We've got this bubbled up effect here. When the pure source puts its light in consciousness, consciousness, consciousness knows I am. So we've got the little I am, little bubbles here, okay? The I am, the self, the pure witness. And when the light of the self uh, reflects on something, then witnessing of that, something happens. So the pure witness opens its light on consciousness, then sees the contents of consciousness when it identifies as the purpose, as the person, this is me, um, then it extends its identity as a reflected witness. And so this is in, in reflected consciousness. And manifestation and thoughtful witnessing can only take place in duality. There has to be a subject and an object, a witness and what is witnessed, the knower and something known in duality. But paradoxically, they are two, but they are not two. So they're two ends of the same thing, an extended temporary self, like that um, transparent link to, to source. Okay, so the reflected witness takes on life. The pure witness I am emerges from source. It sees its reflection and identifies as that reflection. The reflected witness has evolved or emerged from pure witness. And the reflected witness is the I am that person is the shadow on the film of secondary consciousness. The point to make here is that pure consciousness as a reflection that evolves into form, sound, movement, starts to take on life as we know it in our world. And the reflected witness then sees, thinks, touches, smells, hears its way through life, having perception and sensation that continues through to the physical mind and body. So consciousness has existence. Supreme source does not, it's non-existing. Uh, to exist means to be something, a thing, a feeling, a thought, an idea. It means becoming, change, birth, and death. So life is in this reflected consciousness. <clears throat> okay, now let's contrast pure versus reflected consciousness. So the pure consciousness and the pure witness appears as I am. It sees through things in reflected consciousness. It knows that that in reflected consciousness is unreal, transient, not me, not mine, until it sees its reflected witness, okay? So the pure witnessing is detached awareness. It's passionless and wordless. It's like space, unaffected by whatever it contains. And so Mahari says that bodily and mental troubles do not reach it because these are manifestations. And the supreme source is the unmanifest potential. <clears throat> so you are the motionless witness of the river of consciousness. Consciousness is life, okay? You're the motionless uh, witness of life, which changes eternally without changing you as the pure witness in any way. The reflected witness, the I am aware and thinking witness, experiences contrast and conflict as existing in consciousness. So in consciousness, reflected consciousness, clashes exist as do pleasure and pain. But over here in pure consciousness, it is harmonious being because this is duality and this is non-dual. 
Now I want to do a small review of that. And uh, within this little review, it's simplifying, clarifying, and extending, magnifying as well. So it's to say some of these things in a different way with different examples. So the ground of being into becoming. Pure consciousness, the all wisdom source of life is knowledge. I've, I've done perforated lines here because this is part of this. Knowledge is the root, the source of thoughts. Okay, but it's not thinking, but it's the source of thoughts. Okay. Now here we've got um, the I am, the pure witness, the being that bubbles up within pure consciousness here when the light shines on it. And the pure witness, the I am, the self, it knows itself and others as itself. Again, these dotted lines here, it knows itself and others as itself because it's merged together. So basically, by sameness of nature, this is all the same nature here, all the same color here. By sameness of nature, perfect knowledge, which is pure awareness, is attained. And so this is my kind of interpretation here. The knower and the known are one. There is no process of knowing here. You just know. Okay. Then we get the reflected witness. And the reflected witness is in reflected consciousness. And this is where duality begins in consciousness, where uh, knowledge is separated into thinking. This is just pure knowledge and knowing because you are uh, by sameness. And this is knowing by thinking and analyzing. Okay, so the knower thinks to gain knowledge. There is a subject and an object. So thinking is a process for knowing, for understanding the object. And that's a huge, 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 big difference. So <clears throat> um, pure versus reflective awareness. Again, the supreme source and the I am pure witness. Another name also is essence, pure awareness, the reflective witness um, from there, experiencing objects, myself in the world. So the witnessing, there is a difference between awareness as in reflected consciousness and pure awareness in pure consciousness. So over here, reflected awareness is the sense of I am aware, um, is the reflected witness. Well, pure awareness is the essence of reality. That's the point here. Now, my little analogy here is like the credit card. So pure potential, pure awareness is like the credit card. Until you activate it, you're not going to be living your life. Okay. So uh, this is unactivated. It's just there. It sees all the potential. When you activate it, when you jump out onto that screen of reflected um, consciousness, then you are living your life and you are shopping. <laughs> okay, so direct knowledge versus thinking. Again, the supreme source and pure consciousness, the I am essence, pure witness, being, pure awareness, all of that is undivided. It has direct knowledge. The reflected consciousness, so consciousness emerges from source, and has different levels. I'm going to go into this in the next seminar, these different levels of consciousness. So this reflected consciousness emerges from source, has different levels. In consciousness, that's where the world comes into being, containing all that lives and moves. This contains existence. This is potential over here. So this is indirect knowledge gained through perception by thinking to interpret your world. So the reflective witness has thoughts to perceive life and the world. And then the person, the human being, uses the brain and mind, uses um, the ego sense of self for analyzing life and perceiving life. So potential versus manifested actual. Again, supreme source, intelligence, mind. This is the eternal potential. So the past, present, and future, they are all there versus reflective consciousness. 
is the eternal actual, eternal potential, eternal actual. So this is the expressed thoughts and the manifested potential from reflected from emerging from this. And humans experience the physicality and mentality of life, but essentially are just a projection of thought. So mind projects the thought out there and you as pure witness project your thought out there and your reflected witness, you're using your little ego mind as well as you can use your, your higher mind. Consciousness forms the universe. So supreme source is number one. Uh, the I am being pure witness knows. The reflected witness thinks. And the reflected consciousness, this is the new part. Before the world was, consciousness was. In reflected consciousness, the world comes into being. In reflection, in reflected consciousness, it lasts. And into pure consciousness, it dissolves. This is explained a little bit further as well in some of the quotes. And then we have um, the ego sense of self with the mind and the brain. And the little, a, a bit of a formula, matter, the universe and its contents materializing um, and is advanced projected mind from there. Thought, thought form, manifestation. Okay, but there's a gap between pure and reflective awareness. So again, pure awareness and mind with the capital M, the all wisdom, universal consciousness, pure awareness of knowing without cognition versus awareness reflected in consciousness. This is the thinking mind comes into being with reflected awareness using cognition. But there's a gap between mind with a capital M and mind the ego mind. So this is why meditation, stilling the mind. Remember the first quote, in the stillness of my mind and not thinking, is a good strategy to close the little ego mind down and return to the universal mind. Okay. So consciousness. The ocean of consciousness from divine source is infinite and eternal. And creation is in the very nature of consciousness. The world, the universe you observe, is reflected consciousness. The consciousness has form, is, is and holds matter. And you are a speck of reflected consciousness, identifying as a human, that perceives, thinks, and creates. Now, this is an important part here. As pure witness, you shone your light and stepped into reflected consciousness. You stepped onto the Netflix screen, which contains the space, Earth, Melbourne, Vancouver, in which your life moves, the time in which it lasts, and you are the love that gives it life. And there's more on this in the last seminar. So thus your bodily existence is really just a state of mind. It's a movement in consciousness. And life existence, in consci life existence is in consciousness, whereas essence is independent of reflected consciousness. So that was a review, simplifying, clarifying, and magnifying. Now we've got two slides on um, the summary from part one. And the first part is the summary of manifestation. Supreme source, I am being pure witness, uh, reflected consciousness, um, shines its light down into reflected consciousness and the witness, and then the ego mind. So that's the direction, um, uh, the, the way that it goes. Now here, so in consciousness, we've got the world. Here, I've got this cute little baby lion which is like the pure witness and it sees its reflection lived out in life existence becoming a mature um, lion but remember it's not phased by it it's 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 a passive um, witness now another important point that i think um really needs to be 
considered strongly. So pure consciousness as reality does not mean that reflected consciousness, our world, our life, does not mean that reflected consciousness is unreal, false, or fake, or insignificant. You know, everybody's trying to get to enlightenment and just live as this little speck of consciousness and, you know, that bliss. But it's it's uh, consciousness and our life, uh, it's not false, face, uh, fake, or insignificant. Consciousness and life have purpose. And the love of Supreme Source needs consciousness in order to express itself. So I think that's an important point. Okay, now consciousness and thinking, the last of the summary. The pure witness witness consciousness with all its contents. The pure witness identifies as a person, which is its reflection. And then a newer, broader identity is formed, an extension of itself. Going beyond its essence of being as reflected witness, it sees itself and other reflections and takes on that life existence. It's stepped into the Netflix screen and is um, doing its journey. So this is important. The reflected witness subsequently identifies as separate, as existing in the world. And this identifying as separate, many people forget that we are actually linked to pure source and pure energy and, uh, and love and that all, all of that witness. So um, there are many different components of separation. Um, which I think that I may, uh, well, I go into a little bit later, actually in the next one. And it's really, really interesting. Um, so the cognitive powers are uh, the nature of the physical person with the body and the brain. And the brain processes the senses, interprets, analyzes, and thinks. Okay. Now, if the brain is developed and uninjured, then the thinking mind is, uh, can be great, learning and understanding how life works. So we need to take care of our bodies and our brain and learn how to think and learn how to um, sense things and perceive and analyze. Uh, that's helpful to make life more fulfilling. Okay, so now... Part two, the, the first part had a lot of quotes uh, from Maharaj. Now, this is um, further quotes from him and others on enlightenment. And so what he says here, uh, this first quote that I'm going to show you is, uh, whatever happens, happens to you, by you, through you. So you are the creator, the enjoyer, and destroyer of all you perceive. Now, my little brain started to, trying to understand this and analyzing it and trying to get like an analogy. So I'm thinking a little bit like we are like holons. And a holon is something that is both a part and a whole at the same time. So for example, a seed, like this little seed here. So a seed is both a complete thing, the seed, but also a part of something in that it contains a tree. So holons have a characteristic property of facing both ways, facing in and facing out. Holons are complete in themselves and have substantial powers to maintain their own health and integrity. At the same time, they are a part of a wider system, depending on it and participating in it. Holons are self-reliant units that possess a degree of independent, independence and can handle incidents without asking higher authorities for instructions. That is, uh, they have a degree of autonomy. These holons are also simultaneously subject to control from one or more of these higher authorities. So I kind of linked those two together, those two ideas together. Now, here we have another quote from Maharaj, and he is showing um, in, in this picture here, like a hole in the paper, there's the hole, and we pretend that's a paper, but it's actually consciousness. Like a hole in the paper is both in the paper and yet not of the paper. So the supreme state 
is the very center of consciousness and yet beyond consciousness. So this light shining through consciousness, I found these little uh, pictures, I guess, of the flow. And so the light shines out on, from all that is, from Supreme Source, and um, shows the omniverses. I had to look up what omniverses were. So an omniverse is a single multiverse, universes, metaverses, all dimensions and collections or supersets of all regions make up the omniverse, which includes omniverse matter, such as antimatter, planet, spiral galaxies. So all that is, from there, we have omniverses, and we have universes and galaxies. And when you dissect this further and further, soul systems, planets, groups, relationships, and individuals, so you can keep on um, using a magnifying glass, so to speak, and see smaller and smaller units within all that is, and development. So from the solar system here at the top here, the light shining through here, if you take this down, you've got the planet, the continent, the nation, the community, the family, and the person. And from the person, when you dissect that further, and you looked at how did this all happen, well, from the bottom, Higgs uh, boson, quarks, atoms, molecules, cells, organs. So it all keeps on going up from there. So I just added this in for trying to see a, a, a whole way of seeing it, of life and the earth and the universe. So... Uh, this is Maharaj's quote on the beingness of pure consciousness. Now, these quotes that come up next are very meaningful and will help um, when you think back to um, the part one here, um, it will tie in together with that. So he says that there can be no experience. The word experience is, is, is tricky here. There, there can be no experience beyond, I put in brackets, reflected consciousness. So no experience in pure consciousness yet there is the experience he says of just being because there's no other word for just being to say well what is it the experience some people will uh, say it's a context it's a state okay so the experience of just being of the i am so there is a state beyond the reflected consciousness which is not unconscious there is consciousness in it some call it super or pure or supreme consciousness and it's a pure awareness free from the subject-object nexus. So pure awareness, pure knowing. And Ma Maharaj says, for reality to be, the ideas of me and mine must go. And he says, they will go if you let them. Then your normal natural state of I am reappears, in which you are neither the body nor the mind, neither the me nor the mind, but in a different state of being altogether, that essence of state. So it is pure awareness of being without being this or that, without any self-identification with anything in particular or in general. And in that pure light of consciousness, he says there is nothing, not even the idea of nothing. There is only light. So here he's quoting, I am the self, the witness of consciousness, and pure awareness. So he's talking about holistic being and experiencing. So he says the entire universe exists only in consciousness, that's the reflected consciousness, while I, Maharaj, have my stand in the absolute, in pure consciousness. So in pure being, where he stands, consciousness arises. And in consciousness, that's where the world appears and disappears. He says the root is I am. And secondary is a state of mind. There is a world. He says you just are a point of awareness, co-extensive with time and space and beyond both. So you can exist in both, which he's saying on the other side. 
witness and peer awareness. So if you ask me, who are you? My answer would be nothing in particular, yet I am. It's kind of like he's nothing, yet everything as the I am. So he says, all that is lives and moves and has its being, it's experiencing, has its being in consciousness. And I am in and beyond that consciousness. I am in it as the witness and I am beyond it as being. The pure mind sees things as they are, bubbles of reflected consciousness. And these bubbles are appearing, disappearing, and reappearing without having real being, like that spider web. Oh, this is good, too, uh, on pure consciousness. He says that pleasure and pain lost their sway over me. Doesn't feel pain. And pleasure is kind of a non-event. I was free from desire and fear. I found myself full, needing nothing. So being full, needing nothing, it, it, you, you don't have desire because you've got it all. You, you're full. And he says, when I say I am, I do not mean a separate entity with a body as its nucleus. I mean the totality of being, the ocean of consciousness, the entire universe of all that is and knows. I have nothing to desire, for I am complete forever. I saw that in the ocean of pure awareness, on the surface of universal consciousness, the numberless waves of the phenomenal worlds arise and subside beginninglessly and endlessly. As consciousness, they are all me. As events, they are all mine. This is important. He doesn't know it all, and nor do I. <laughs> there is a mysterious power that looks after them. It's still a mystery. And, um, you know, there are various religions that will, you know, have their say of what that is, but it, it still seems a mystery. So there's a mysterious power that looks after them, and it is the foundation, the ultimate support of all that is. What he suggests for us to do is um, to uh, embrace life. He says, live with intention. Walk to the edge. Life is meaningful. Remember that one before um, a few slides back? Life is meaningful. So walk to the edge. Listen hard. Practice wellness. Play with abandon. Laugh. Choose with no regret. Appreciate your friends. Continue to learn. Do what you love. Live as if this is all there is. So he's very holistic and wholesome. And um, not just spiritual, he um, seems to uh, suggest that we really engage in life in a good way. So this is the divine spark in pure consciousness to the ego sense of self. So the world you perceive, these are his quotes still, the world you perceive is made of consciousness, what you call matter is consciousness itself. So physical matter is consciousness itself. You are so accustomed to think of yourselves as bodies having consciousness that you just cannot imagine consciousness as having bodies. The reverse way around. Bodily existence is but a state of mind, a movement in consciousness. The ocean of consciousness is infinite and eternal. And creation is the very nature of consciousness. Bodily existence is but a state of mind. Now, he's got an analogy to a burning incense stick. So he says, and I found a picture of burning incense, well, a match. Okay. So he says, all exists in awareness. That's pure consciousness and source. Um, and awareness neither dies nor is reborn. Pure consciousness is there, source is there, it does not die nor is reborn, it's 
uh, has no end, it has no beginning, okay? So it is the changeless reality itself because it's potential. All the universe of experience is born with the body, the physical body, and dies with the body. It has its beginning and end in awareness, but awareness knows no, no beginning nor end. So here he's going to describe this analogy a little bit more. So through practice, you will come to see the light of awareness in all its clarity, and the world will fade out of your vision. Says it's like looking at a burning incense stick. You see the stick and the smoke. You see the stick here and the smoke first. And when you notice the fiery point, the fiery red point, if I can, yeah, the fiery red point, you realize that it has the power to consume mountains of sticks and fill the universe with smoke. Timelessly, the self actualizes itself without exhausting its infinite possibilities. So in this incense stick simile, he says, the stick is the body and the smoke is the mind. And as long as the mind is busy with all of these contortions, it does not perceive its own source. So basically to be looking inwards, not just outwards, to be looking inwards as well and still the mind. So consciousness is forever changing. So pure consciousness is primordial. It is the original state. And reflected consciousness is on contact. So a reflection of pure consciousness against a surface. So this is a state of duality, potential that has manifested. So pure consciousness is absolute. Reflected consciousness is relative to its content. Reflected consciousness is partial and changeful. Pure consciousness is total, changeless, calm, and silent. It is the common matrix of every experience. So from spiritual to human identity. As a pure witness, you are a speck of pure consciousness, of pure awareness, and all you can say about yourself is, I am. So you are pure being, pure awareness. The I am is aware of itself, but aware as being. It does not think I am aware. It just knows I am. So it does not identify as a human being. In the reflected secondary dual or living consciousness, there is the I, the reflected witness, identifying as a person who is conscious, who thinks, perceives, and lives in this time-space reality. But remember that there is that link between the two. We are not disconnected. So reflected consciousness and matter. Reflected consciousness is the subtle, and I looked up what that meant as well, delicate, refined, intelligent. Reflected witness is the subtle counterpart of matter, Mahari says. Just as inertia and energy are attributes of matter, so does harmony manifest itself from consciousness. So harmony from pure source manifests itself in uh, reflected consciousness. So you may, may consider it in a way as a form of very subtle energy. Wherever matter organizes itself into a stable organism, consciousness appears spontaneously. And so this is my idea down here. When a thought, a concept is incomplete, still being developed, then form has not yet come into being. But with clarity, then thought can manifest itself into a stable organism and become consciousness and become conscious. Desire manifested the world. So again, still more quotes here. Causation. So that's something that has been caused. Uh, causation means sequence in time of events in space. And that space can be physical or mental. So time, space, action are mental categories, imagined, 
arising and subsiding with the mind. And it is desire, Mahari says, that gives birth, that gives name and form. The desirable is imagined. We got to have good imaginations. Uh, it's the desirable is imagined and wanted and manifests itself as something tangible or conceivable. Thus is created the world in which we live, our personal world. All of that created from mind and imagination. And more about this in the next seminar and seminar four. So consciousness and duality. <clears throat> Reflected consciousness and the world appear and disappear together. And so they're like two aspects of the same state, like heads and tails on a coin. So no reflected consciousness, no world. Mahari says you are the ultimate potentiality from source of which the all-embracing consciousness is the manifestation and expression. You are and I am, but only as points in consciousness, we are nothing apart from consciousness. The world itself is contact, and the totality of all contacts actualized in reflected consciousness. Perception, while well, in the body, in the physical body, depends on the condition of the brain. But the self is beyond both, beyond the brain, beyond the mind. The fault of the instrument, which is the brain, the physical brain, is no reflection on its user. So people with brain damage or if they've had a car accident and they've acquired brain damage or things like that, um, I think we need to be patient and compassionate because these things are not their fault. It's not a reflection on um, their um, limitations It's uh, as a whole being. To know that consciousness and its content are but reflections, changeful and transient, he says, is actually focusing on the real. You know that there is the real as well as the transient. And right now we are in the transient. Some of us might be at the witnessing um, um, state as well. Um, all things depend on consciousness and consciousness depends on the witness. So this world is painted by you on the screen of consciousness and is entirely your own private world. So if you don't attach to or identify as a uh, reflected witness, when you're the pure witness, then you don't become the person and you're just passively watching, um, watching the world go by, okay? So mind. According to Ramana Maharishi, mind is a wondrous power residing in the self. So this is capital S. Uh, it causes all thoughts to arise. Apart from thoughts, there is no such thing as mind. So mind is all about thoughts. Thought is the nature of mind. Apart from thoughts, there is no independent entity called the world because we've thought the world through, it's come from the mind. In deep sleep, there are no thoughts and there is no world. That's something to think about. In the states of waking and dream, there are thoughts and there is a world also. So once you realize that the body, physical body depends on the mind and the mind on consciousness and consciousness on awareness, and not the other way around. Your question about waiting for self-realization till you die is answered because it's all there. You are an extension of supreme source. Now, I just put this a little bit the other way around here. So the physical body depends on the brain and mind. The mind depends on the uh, reflected witness in reflected consciousness. The reflected witness depends on the pure witness, which is in uh, which is pure awareness being. And there is an intelligent vital energy that links all of these and more about this in a later one. 
Now, my interpretation of uh, unity to duality and uh, manifestation. So we've just got a few more slides. So my first point here is pure universal consciousness is dormant mind uh, that is pure knowledge, intelligence, potentiality, creation, etc. So it's outside of time and space. There is no duality. However, mind is also described as the all. It, can, it contains the essence of the universe. So that, to me, infers it's complex. It has complexity. So the pure witness, in my mind, is the combination um, or merging of being the knower and the knowing, which I had said a little bit before, without the process of knowing. So it's all one as a unit, the knower and the known together as one, without the process of knowing. That's the pure witness. The process of knowing, it's a process, it means it's, it goes in time. It's, um, so a process of knowing is thinking, so there has to be duality. Duality because there's the thinker, the thinking, and the thought. Okay, so mind gives rise to the breakdown, the breakthrough, the break open of knowledge into components of thoughts and concepts. This is what I kind of perceive. Mind gives rise to that, shines the light on that, opens up. So the pure witness, as a speck of mind, knows that the breakthrough for life, for existence, necessitates the dimensions of time and space in order for causation to occur. So the pure witness sees life in the universe reflected in 3D consciousness and knows it would have to merge, expand, or change its identity in order to utilize thought and creativity in an active way. So it jumps into... a. a it, it takes on the reflected witness identity, is on the Netflix screen, and uh, is in life in the world. The pure witness is self-aware and aware of, but unfazed by, the jumble of manifested life. But desire and love compel the Netflix of life to come alive. Desire and love. And we go into that in seminar form or two. Okay, the ego mind and thinking, and this is deliberate versus unselective. So together, our personal mind and brain manage thinking. Again, this is the, these are my thoughts. These are not quotes from other people. So our, um, our personal mind and brain manage thinking. So that's like analyzing, interpreting, imagining, creating ideas. In other words, it's perception. So in our day-to-day -day activities, our mind draws thoughts, attracts thoughts to it. It generates thoughts as well. It attracts thoughts to it like gravity draws objects downward toward Earth. So we may also consider the law of attraction, where like attracts like. Thus, positive thinking draws more positive thoughts, while negative thinking can become a downward spiral of continuing negativity. And you ask any psychologist about uh, negative thinking and the downward spiral of that. They will agree with that. So human beings with the ability to use mind to think are co-creators with um, source mind. Okay, Our minds are like crayons. Our little minds here are like crayons, helping to shape and color in our life existence. So reflected consciousness, life, is continually growing and changing due to our thoughts and actions, being co-creators. So haphazard thinking can take you down the wrong garden path. And by chance, I found this on internet about haphazard thinking. And it says, the life of wisdom is a life of reason. It is important to learn how to think clearly. Clear thinking is not haphazard, is not a haphazard enterprise. It requires proper training. Okay. 
So now the finale, and I think we are doing right on time here. So there's just a couple of um, slides here. So this is the conclusive note, and basically it is to know yourself. So the idea is to learn to know yourself, get more and more familiar with your holistic uh, sense of self. So you are pure consciousness here to magnify the beauty and wonder of the physical domains, quote from Mother Ocean. And remember like the spider in the spider web, your thoughts and your life, you emit from your mind, withdraw it back in when you die, emit again, etc., back and forth. So that's the end of this first seminar, The Theosophy of How Life Manifests. The next one, um, seminar two, is on higher consciousness in human being. And this explains further about consciousness. Remember, there's lots of different states of consciousness. And it explains more about the mind and spiritual development in human life. So it's a continuation on. And it's it's actually easier than this first one. This first one is pretty deep and hard. The rest of them are a lot easier. So that's the next one. And then we go on to the third and the fourth. So now going to say thank you and open up for comments and questions. And we have about almost 20 minutes. So we're right on time. How about that? Just want to thank Dr. Golding, and I'm going to uh, uh, open it up now for questions. So um, if you can't unmute, then I can unmute you. I think we'll just unmute one at a time if you want to ask a question rather than I unmute everybody. I think that's probably the way to go. So do you want to um, stop sharing the screen? So okay. we... hello, everybody. <laughs> you survived.